The answer to the question of whether Switzerland is a, or the European system is a viable alternative to the U.S. is, of course, a, from my perspective, a qualified yes. After all, I am biased. I'm uh, admittedly biased because I'm heading over uh, to Switzerland to do some postdoctoral studies um, thanks to a grant from the Swiss National Science Foundation and also because I'm a great uh, host and co-author in Rolf Wustenhagen at the University of St. Gallen and some other colleagues at ETH Zurich. Now, why this is the case, why I'm saying that this is the case requires a short story. So, to, is this any better? Yeah, but, much better. Yeah. So I hope you'll bear with me with my story. Uh, I couldn't decide how to frame my remarks either in terms of my own experience or to attempt to take something and try to pull out some, tease out some generalizable bits. And frankly, I just decided to do both and we'll just move forward with that. So a little bit about who I am or my background previous to getting a PhD is I spent about a decade and a half, unfortunately, uh, in uh, venture-backed startups, typically in Utah and Silicon Valley, uh, either founding them myself or in the process of funding them as a venture capitalist. And so um, after doing that for some period of time, I decided to get a PhD uh, for a couple reasons. First, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. offered uh, an NSF fellowship, which I, again, gratefully accepted. The, the conceit there at the time, in 2005, was that uh, they had a number of uh, hard scientists that were attempting to build renewable energy technologies, and the goal, they're having a difficult time commercializing them. So the conceit was, at the time, that you take an entrepreneur and try to turn the entrepreneur into a a renewables person rather than taking a hard scientist and attempt to, to drag that person through the bench of the commercialization process. I'll, I'll leave it for another discussion as to whether that was a good idea or a bad idea or whether I was a useful guy in that regard or not. Be that as it may, that somehow got me in the door into doing a PhD. And I started working on my dissertation and I discovered something kind of curious and that, that related to my experience wandering around in the venture industry and talking to other venture capital scholars and talking to other scientists. Um, and I started working out in my dissertation the theory and empirical tests on this emerging phenomenon, which is that sometime around 2004, U.S. venture capital firms started investing overseas and starting to do so in an increasing proportion, a significant proportion, as a matter of fact. I won't bore you with the details, and it's the first law of graduating with your PhD is not to bore people with your dissertation, so we'll move on from that. Um, the net net is that the world is globalizing and that has some significant implications for innovation, for entrepreneurship, for the mobility of talent, and thus venture capital investment. And that's basically what I worked on. I'm happy to talk at length about that after, after the, the panel discussion or even during it if you choose to. So you know, I observed that as it relates to the, to the, the question at hand that the globalized world provides collaborative opportunities that are enhanced compared to a couple decades ago for research outside of the United States. And this mirrors my experience in venture-backed startups and in the venture capital industry, fundraising, allocations, and management. And kind of translating that paragraph that I wrote down here into, into kind of sensible things. What I'm trying to say is, in the case of venture investment and innovation, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening overseas. And frankly, in terms of most interesting technologies, a lot of interesting stuff happening elsewhere, where elsewhere means outside of the United States and outside of our own magnet institutions. As Dr. Vest points out, his work, by the way, is a touchstone, and I recommend if you haven't read the book, uh, the, the Rise of the American Research University, that you do. It's a great book. Uh, and building on some of his ideas that he talked about here, that the United States has depended to a great extent on the influx of top engineering talent, top brain power coming into the United States, getting trained in an American magnet university, and then staying it. And that works out really well for us in the US. So we get all the benefits of that. Those folks go into large companies, they work in institutions, they tend to then invent stuff, and then they tend to go ask their employer whether they want to commercialize the invention. The employer says no, or maybe, or a qualified yes, and the person leaves, takes their venture capital money, and goes off and builds Facebook builds Cisco systems from the Shockley Semiconductor era and a number of other hosts of pieces. As it turns out, um, Saxanian, a uh, scholar who did work for the Public Policy Institute in California, mentions that one in four uh, venture-backed firms in the United States from like 1950 forward um, were either founded or have a senior executive who's a first generation, uh, basically an immigrant. And that's, uh, that's from a 2005 study. So what's happening, what's changed, and what I discovered in my dissertation is that this, 
this process, the structural break is changing. People aren't coming here, staying. They're getting trained and then going home. And what's happening as a result is, you know, in a, so what that highlights is that there's a, this, all this phenomenon reflects a maturing innovation clusters outside the US, um, mainly the result of solid public policy decisions. Um, Chris Hill, a scholar here at George Mason, talks about this in the form of a natural return to equilibrium. And we can talk about this at length, which is you know, part of what you're seeing in terms of uh, the American innovation cycle where uh, we is a post hoc explanation for an observed fact. The observed fact is that the US has led for a great uh, deal of time in terms of innovative capability. A lot of it has to do that the rest of the world was bombed in submission in 1940. So as the world has grown economically, everywhere, as research clusters come back online, we're now seeing a natural return of innovative, of innovative capability all over the world. And we're seeing individuals who get trained in U.S. In universities going where other smart people are. That's what smart people want to do, by the way, is they want to go be with other smart people. 